I'm very happy to be able to introduce this film about the restoration of the Wheeler Opera House masonry. This is actually a project, it's been in the works for over a decade, since 2011. And as we know, the Wheeler is a really iconic Aspen building, but it's also one of the grandest opera houses in the West. Uh, it was designed by a very preeminent architect at the time, and it also was a symbol of Aspen, a uh, symbol of this booming Aspen mining town. But you don't want to be fooled. It's not a symbol of that era. It's also a very, very hardworking facility. Between tours, performances, rentals, and uh, different events, it is activated 350 to, 250 to 300 days a year. So it's a very hardworking facility. But built in 1889, uh, it's had numerous uh, exterior repairs, some good and some not so good. And the not so good resulted in deterioration of the masonry uh, and ultimately safety and uh, aesthetic issues. In 2018, the city assessed the masonry. The recommendation came back that there should be a full restoration. So 2019, the city hired a contract to do that work with a schedule of summer of 2020, completion uh, spring of 21. The project was massive. It was extensive. It was very expensive. It went on a full year longer than anticipated. And city council's role, and I was on city council at the time, our role was to maintain the enthusiasm for the project, uh, sustain the support for the process, and also mitigate the enormous impacts that this project had in downtown. But it got done. And this film is about the story who, it's a story about the people who got it done. It's about the people who worked on the project and brought the masonry back to its original excellent, excellence and also are taking it into the future, maybe for the next hundred years. Between the architects, the stonemasons, the uh, quarry workers, individually and uh, collaboratively, they explain in this film, they explain their experience, their expertise, attention to detail, and the perseverance of when things got a little bit tough. So, and I must say, it's a project that's very, very um, important to document because of the work we got done here and these individual interviews. So ultimately, ultimately it's a story of the success of this team, as I said, individually and collaboratively, to restore this iconic building, our Wheeler Opera House. Wheeler Opera House is special, one, because it, it represents a wealth of the city at the time of the silver boom. And the construction of an opera house throughout the West meant that you were no longer a podunk town, but you had sort of come of age and were cultured. The Wheeler Opera House, at the time it was constructed, was considered the most opulent, possibly in the West, definitely in the state. And there's several other opera houses that were competing, but none of them had electricity. It was the first to be fully electric, which was a very big deal. Since then, it's remained one of the fixtures of Aspen. Even the height limits for the town were based off of the Wheeler's height. So it's been important from the time it was built in town currently. And I would say for the historic structure that it is, it is working harder than any other I have seen to date. A remarkable amount of shows go through the Opera House in any one season. I cannot think of any other Opera House of its age and importance that has as much going on. The architect that um, designed the building, uh, he was actually from Chicago. He and his partner had worked on many projects throughout the country, um, including some of the academic buildings at Notre Dame and the Georgia State Capitol. Um, and sometime in, the, in around 1881, um, he was brought to Denver, I believe, to work on the Tabor Opera House that was in Denver. He was very um, prom like prominent in the use of this Roma Romanesque revival. Elements of that style are the, the rounded window arches and the rusticated stone um, that you see on the building. So it's um, kind of a rough cut, you know, it has a lot of um, um, unevenness to it. So it very much reflects the time period in which it was, was built. 
One of the interesting discoveries that we made on the project is that many of the, the stones on the exterior facade, they go the full width of the, the exterior wall. Um, so, and they're very rough on the back side. So it, it's very, um, very evident that they were carving the stone on site and, and kind of building, you know, as they went. They had a design, but they were um, working it out in the field. It's a load-bearing masonry wall at the Wheeler. Um, so the stone is performing a structural function as well as a, a decorative function. The load-bearing masonry wall is, um, is structurally sound and um, you know the areas of stone that have deteriorated uh, on the building are, are typically elements that are projecting from the facade that weathered differently than the, than the main areas. And also the, um, there was one section of the exterior wall which had pr prolonged exposure to water from a roof drain and that area um, experienced some cracking. So those areas will be replaced. So if we hadn't done this work, the, the exterior would continue to, to deteriorate and there were, you know, there were potential you know, safety concerns as well as potential areas where further deterioration could occur, whether it was stone uh, water infiltration into the building or um, other structural concerns. We started talking about this project about three years ago. We have a, a long range plan and on our long range plan we had the knowing that we had the need to look at the exterior structure of the building. We had had a report performed by a, a stone mason specialist back in 2011 and they had deemed that the building was in, generally in good shape and, and that was true all throughout the last 10 years. But there was a citizen that was concerned about some specific aspects of uh, the, the stone. They were concerned that maybe we needed to accelerate that investigation and to get in front of any potential problems that the building might have. You look at the building and yes, it looked really in good shape. But when you got up close and you got up to those upper levels, you could see, start to see where there was water intrusion coming off of probably previous roofs. Now we had a new roof installed in 2015 and so that eliminated any of the drainage issues that might have been there before. But the building had sustained some water infiltration and so we en enlisted Roland and Broughton Architects again to help us start that investigation. And another large national firm, Wisjani and Associates, helped do some investigation and they identified a couple of areas that were problematic but they also confirmed to us that in general the building's in good shape for a 130 year old stone building. And so then we brought Mills and Schnoring on. They brought in a couple of more experts to help us analyze what the issues were. And uh, then we brought in Aspen Constructors again and they helped us and we brought in Summit Sealants out of Denver. And Summit Sealants has an extensive background in doing historical renovations. You know, you just can't run down the, the street and buy a bunch of stone and put it on the building. You have to find the right stone, you have to find the right quarry. And unfortunately, the quarry that, that the stone came from no longer exists. It's up the frying pan road up towards Rudai, and that has been offline for, for decades. And so we couldn't just go and source the stone that's currently on the building from the original quarry. We had to go out and find a match. So yes, one of the challenges on the project was finding a replacement stone that, that matched both aesthetically, as far as the color and the texture, as well as its material properties. We had an architectural conservator that was working with us that helped us identify certain stones. And then we had a series of mock-ups done last September using different stones to assess their physical properties. One of the stones that had a very good aesthetic match was this stone that sourced from Wyoming. And we found that it, you know, it had been used on other building projects and its material qualities were very similar to the stone at the Wheeler. And that's why that stone was selected. 
and also that they could they could quarry it in the, the quantities that were needed for this project. There were some samples from the peach blow sandstone quarry, but there were were not of sufficient quantities. This is a needed project to continue the building functioning the way it always has and the long-term sustainability of the building. We didn't have stone or mortar or any other masonry items coming off the building that we were noticing, but we were getting to the point where you might cross that threshold if it had gone another five years unchecked. And if we hadn't have done anything, then you might have started to have some problems. So we were kind of right up against the threshold of where we needed to do something. With the COVID situation, we decided to take advantage of the fact that the Wheeler was idle. I believe the last full year that the Wheeler was, was open, it had events something like 300 out of 365 nights. We are taking advantage of a, of a tough situation for the town and getting this work performed where hopefully it has the least amount of impact to the community. Initially, one of our challenges was surveying the building. They positioned a crane in the back parking lot. We had a, a couple different site visits where we examined the, the exterior facade. For building this building in 10 months was pretty good. I give them credit because this is all hand done. You know, all this combing here and, you know, splitting the face and everything, that's all hand done. So I give them credit. Hey, craftsmen back then. So up at the top here, we can see deterioration of the mortars through the years. If people have come in again and tried to fix this with the wrong type of mortars, they just bring people in whenever they start seeing a problem and just try and fix it. So it's just a piecemeal trying to keep it together. But now they're doing it the right way. Do the whole thing, let's get it all fixed one time. Then we don't have these issues. So you can see how the mortar is basically gone. So we're gonna fix all these joints, get this all watertight again, replace that, replace some of these bricks. But if you come over here, look at the bottom from the top, come down about two and a half, three feet, and just look at the mortar joints. You can see how it's just disappearing. It's deteriorated. We'll come up there and we'll repoint all the tops there and make those repairs as necessary to get the upper parts structurally sound. But there's quite a bit here, but they're doing it right. It's gonna do it, let's fix it all. All right, we're on the top of the arches here. One of the things they did wrong years ago is they painted all the stone. And so the stone has to be able to breathe. And if it can't breathe, you get water that penetrates inside of there. Now it has to try to come out somehow. And it's gonna to try to come out through the face and then you're gonna get the freeze and thaw. You know, water freezes, it swells, and it starts popping the stone off. And this is what you start getting all this effect. Years ago, we don't know when, but somebody came back here and patched this with a regular mortar because if you look over here, that's original stone. That's a patch, that's a patch. And so right now, that patch is roughly about three quarters of an inch thick. So what we assumed is all these stones in this area here probably look like this. And so now they just try to fill it in to make it look like stone again. And then they painted it. And that's, that's the biggest no-no, because now you just made things worse. You trapped the water in there. And you know, areas like this, we just used our hand and we pulled it out. We didn't use no tools or nothing. It just wanted to fall out. And now, then again, like we said, this is a life safety issue. We're up 50 something feet. You got a piece of stone coming down and we do have uh, the uh, store down below us, the art store. So this is her entrance area. So this is the last thing you'd want. This is the first process of the stripping. You're putting down what's called a super stripper. And as you notice, you put a clear film over it, but you can already see the paint is actually starting to come up. 
So they'll put this down, let it sit for a while, and then they'll come back, take the plastic off, scrape it, put it in buckets and trash, and they'll put another, until we can get down to the primer, which is a grayish color. And then at that point, we put down what's called the peel away one, or yeah, peel away one. It's a paste that we cover with uh, paper. And that will sit, we'll let that dwell for 24 hours. Then we scrape that off. And then we wash it off and we get down to clean stone. And that's the process they're going through right now, getting this paint off. It's very time consuming, you know. The worst thing you wanna do is paint the stone and not having to take it off. It's just, it's really time consuming. And the guys have to be very careful wearing their gloves and everything like that because it is caustic. And, but they've been doing it for a while so they understand that. Okay, now uh, you can see it's starting to come off. That's what we want to get down to. At that point, we put the peel away one on. So it comes off. These are the new pieces that we've installed. And then this is an original piece. And being a historical building, it, you know, we want to save what we can. And this piece is in excellent condition, so this piece will stay in. Because this is original to the building when they built it 130 years ago. All of these stones here are going to get replaced. Because they see the fracturing on the face. Probably had a water issue from that roof so the water would run down the face and freeze and through all the years it finally fractured all these stones to where now we're gonna have to replace these so there is a quite a bit of work in this one area here and then you come here and you can see again where the edge this fell off they've tried to patch it through the years here they did a patch across here. The original joint is right here in the stone. But you notice they put one here, they try to put one here. But seeing that that's the original joint, there's the crack. It's gonna follow the original joint. And I was interested where the original joint here. Well, it was right here, but they put one here and filled it in. Then they try to put one over here and they filled it in. So it's just a lot of little mistakes that we're gonna rectify. And this is where the architect comes in. She, she can look at the pictures and say, okay, let's, you know, let's take this one out, but we can repair that one, let's repair that one. This one here, maybe put a Dutchman in here for that corner, you know. And this is where the architect, his name is Catherine, this is where we depend on her. You know, what she wants, we, we can, we'll do it for her. What we do is, since we have these joints are big enough here, we can drill it with a quarter inch drill bit. We're not gonna to touch this stone because we don't wanna damage this stone, but we drill it in 45 degrees in each direction, which breaks up the mortar, the existing mortar. And then we bring in our Sawzall. We have a special blade that cuts the mortar out. And we can cut the mortar out. And once we got it cut out, top and bottom, we just pop the piece and it slides right out. And then they'll clean up all the excess inside there if there's any damage in the back or anything that needs to be repaired, they do all the repairs then. Then we'll drill, put our helical ties in, and then we're ready to set the stone. And then we could talk about tuck pointing. So all the joints in the building here, we're gonna re-tuck point. So we're using historical mortars with historical color. And what we have found is when they re-tuck pointed this, in the 80s, whenever they did it, what you're supposed to do is you got to knock this back normally twice. To, you know, you take the width here and you just knock it back twice that width. So at minimum three quarters of an inch. What we had found is whoever tuck pointed this years ago, they just knocked off the bead and just went over the top. And that's why we're having lots of failures. You can see why it's, it's real kind of sloppy here. It's not a clean joint like you got down inside here. It's just real sloppy and they don't have the thickness. So it dries out, you don't have the strength and it just wants to fall out. But if we go over here, 
this is what somebody came back and they did years ago. As you can see how dark it is, because we haven't done anything over here as tuck pointing wise, but you can see the different size of beading. They use different size bead tools. This is a 3 8, that's a 3 8, but then you look at this here, that's a half inch bead tool. It bounces around and we're like, why do they do that? I don't know. But, you know, a good example is they didn't really go back two quarters of an inch here. They just took the bead off and went over the top. And that's why we have pieces. I had to, I hope you guys saved, where you can actually see it is one of these pieces here. But we're gonna go back. And this is why you have this look. It sticks out so far. It's, it's just a hard looking joint. And down here is, you know, that's not a very, that one's terrible looking too. Where you want a, a cleaner look. They just kind of bounced around everywhere. So where we're coming at the consistent 3 8 speed, like they had historically. So we're trying to make them back the way it was when they built it. And that's our whole idea, is get it back to where she was. That's your combing right here, or some people call it raking, where you can see most of this is gone. You can see a shadow of it, but that's just through 130 years. If you would come underneath, you get a better idea of the combing underneath here, or the raking. Because you know you can actually see it a lot better. And most of the combing on the top has gone through the years. So that's why our new stones won't have combing on the top. Because we want the water to shed off of it. We don't want it to hang on to it and freeze and thaw and cause damage in the long run. We worked with Sarah Adams to not only get the spacing of the combing, so between the teeth of the comb, and then also to soften the look. Because when we originally had the carvers fabricate those, they were really distinct because they're brand new. So what we've done is then gone back and sandblast the, that combing to soften that look so that it mimics the combing that's right next to it that's 130 years old because we didn't want it to look brand new and then weathered. That's been a little bit of a challenge is to get that combing right. But that's all handled by our stone carvers. And now you can see how the beading is more consistent. It's not out on the face like the old stuff. So it's just a cleaner look. And then again, like I said, we still have to wash the building once we're done. Very low pressure washer. We don't want to inject water into the stone. So we'll use the detergent and then we just rinse it down. And that'll clean, because you know, you're cleaning all the white here, because that's from tuck pointing. So now when we wash that, all that disappears, all this will disappear this dirty water look. And then we'll fine tune the paint. If we find any paint pieces, then we'll try to strip those off at the same time. So once we get down to the bottom, only people coming up here will be the painter and he's caulking the windows and we're done. And then they come in here and they'll seal this with a spec right now is silicone sealant. And now we can stop the water from penetrating inside of the building causing damage. So that'll be the last thing that happens before we take the scaffolding down. And then while they're doing that, this scaffolding is pinned to the building with three quarter inch all threads. So when we're ready to take this uh, scaffolding down, I'll unscrew these because they do come out. Then I can patch the stone. We have special yarn motors that I can match the stone. I patch the stone, I put the bead in there and then you'll never know there was a hole here. And then, and that's the whole idea here. The quality of materials that were used to construct the wheeler and the quality of materials that are being used in the restoration are very, very good. And the work that we're doing now will be a very durable repair going into the future. It may require spot repairs in the future, but not anything widespread. every so many years, every couple of years, come up here and do an inspection. If you see anything wrong like this, 
you have the formula for the mortars, repair it and keep this building tight. And then you won't have issues down the line like they've had before. And with the new stone being, you know, no texture on the top and everything, we should be good. And just keeping the building clean, keeping it watertight, it'll last another 130 years. I think what I've really enjoyed about working not only on the Wheeler, but uh, the Armory and the streets buildings and now at the old powerhouse, are taking these buildings that have been around a long time and are really part of the fabric of the city of Aspen and making them better, making them more useful for the occupants and, and the users of the building. And really, you know, the Wheeler's 130 years old and if what we're doing now can help it last another 130 years, you know, that, it really gives you satisfaction about uh, working on these projects.